Oh, hello, hello. Sorry, guys. Bit of a slow start on this one. Just trying to make sure everything's working all right. It's been a while. Hey, thanks for joining. All right, I think we're good. Yeah, sorry, there was a bit of a, a dead start there for about a minute. I was just trying to sort out the live stream interface, but I think we're good now. Anyway, apologies for that. Hopefully I can either cut out that first minute or you can skip past it if you're watching this later. But for those who joined live, thank you for joining. How are you all doing? Let me know what you've been up to over this last month or two uh, since I've been away, since I've been traveling. And this is my first stream since coming back just to uh, update you guys and um, have a chat, see how it's been and yeah, share some of the the experiences from this little trip that I did. But yeah, I got back a few days ago. Uh, hopefully the audio is working. That's, that's part of what I was trying to fix because I think it's good. I had some issues last time. But yeah, let me know if the audio is good or if it's too high or too low or anything like that. I think there's been some changes with um, <laughs> with both my software that I use and with YouTube. Okay, cool. Thanks for the feed. Let's see if this thing's up. All right, cool. Steve, greetings from Florida. Hello. Elias from Spain. Thanks for joining. In the States. Cool, cool, cool. Have not been traveling. <laughs> yeah, we... Audio is good. All right, cool. But yeah, when did I get back? About the 23rd. So it's been a few days. What's been up since then? Just trying to get over the jet lag. Um, I probably should have made a coffee for this. And uh, yeah, just been chilling, starting to go through my, um, you know, unpacking and, and importing some files from, from all the footage and photos and um, sorting through some of the film that I shot and, and starting to process some of that film as well. So if you saw the thumbnail, I was hoping to try and um, have it all here. Like my film's actually back there somewhere piled up. I don't know if you can make it out, but I have the copy stand there. And all the film, I'm trying to sort through it. Basically, I shot about 22 rolls of black and white. And this is over the course of six weeks. So it's not too bad. It's not, you know, sounds like a lot. But yeah, on your question, Elias, the time difference is five hours. It was six while we were there. I think daylight savings must have ended while we were there. Um, so yeah, when you're flying back east, that's when you kind of feel the jet lag because it's hard to go to sleep at a normal hour end up staying up till two or three but i'm starting to readjust now um yeah so it's it's all right yeah in terms of film uh you know you can if you have a look at the thumbnail i don't want to <laughs> grab it all because it's a bit of a mess back there yeah about 22 rolls of black and white about eight rolls of color maybe and um some digital shots so i use my little olympus xz1 for quite a bit of street shooting and then also the r6 for some photography as well for the slower pace stuff uh, not as much for street on this trip as much as the last one and obviously for all the video footage so yeah it was a great experience what i'll do because it's easier i'm just going to show you uh, it was this is really bad by the way this video i'm about to show you it's just like a quick kind of a teaser trailer thing of um you know, this is Vietnam, some of the stuff, some of the experiences. So, you know, this is Hanoi, is it? I can't remember now. Yeah. So we went up to the mountains in Vietnam. We rented motorbikes. We did the Hajang Loop, which was really cool. Um, heaps of um, great experiences doing that. That's probably one of my favorite things on the whole trip. So we kind of went from the south up to the north and did this motorbike loop and went to uh, Sapa. And in each of the areas where we stayed for a little bit, I tried to get out and do some photography. Um, some more so in some cities than others. Sapa was actually pretty cool for street photography. This is it right now. So I'm going to have some street process vlogs coming up, sharing some of those types of shots. And then there's other types of photography where it was just more scenery and landscape kind of stuff in Japan, which is what you're seeing now. Some night photography in Japan, long exposures. It was um, snowy when we went up to Yusawa. 
stayed there, did some snowboarding. Um, yeah, I'm not showing all that footage here. This is just something I quickly slapped together. Just to give you a quick idea of uh, some of the experiences so you have a visual sense of it, because I know at least for me that helps. Yeah, it's looping back over to, to Vietnam now. So, yeah. Um, for anyone who, who was watching along up to the lead up for this and saw my video about what I'm packing, I'm sure you have some sense of, uh, you know, what we were up to. But if you weren't keeping up to date, basically, yeah, we went to Vietnam, we went to Japan and ended in Bangladesh, which um, we were meant to come back actually on the 21st, but the flight got delayed two days. It got cancelled, I guess, and then rescheduled for two days later. Not even sure why. But yeah, it wasn't so bad because over there we were staying with Sarah's family and it was like an extra two days, which was actually pretty good. And I actually did more street photography there than any of the other two countries. It's just somewhere I love. Uh, Dhaka is, you know, an excellent city for street photography. And if you remember, I'm also working on a black and white street photography series um, for a book, hopefully, that lends itself well to that type of photography in Bangladesh and even in Vietnam, I think I have some good stuff from there. So yeah, let's go through some comments and then I'm gonna look at some of the Q&A from Instagram because I put up a little sticker on my story there just asking for questions uh, for anyone who wanted to ask some questions about anything really. So if you do wanna do that and you're here live, feel free to drop it in the chat box and I'll have a look. Um, this is a good one already, uh, TSA handshake on all 20 rolls. So I think I had about I think 30 rolls maybe all together. So yeah, if you count the color, um, how do I go with hand checks? Good question. So as I mentioned in my video before leaving, my main priority was to get out of Melbourne who, where they have the CT scanners with a hand check. And I was successful in doing that. Okay. So it was initially refused. And then I used my um, strategy of, of having some 3,200 speed rolls in there. One of them was a real roll, but it was old, expired in 2000 that I just chucked in there, some Delta. And then I fixed up about three or four rolls with a fake Delta and T-Max 3200 label that I just slapped on there. And I even made, I had like an old empty canister or two of Delta, I think, that I just stuck on like, you know, uh, a real film tongue, but it was actually empty just to make it look like a real roll. Once I showed them that and they called their supervisor and they're like, okay, yeah, cool. Hand check it after about, you know, two or three back and forths. Exact same experience I've had in Melbourne before. So once they saw that, they're like, oh yeah, that'll damage it. Let's hand check the whole thing. So it's a good strategy. I'm starting to like it. And long story short, for the rest of the trip, I managed to get through mostly with hand checks, but I did uh, have to put it through x-rays in Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. They outright refused. So, but that was just a normal x-ray. So I don't mind too much. And as mentioned, I tried to take mostly 400 speed and below. It's mostly black and white. Um, half, well, about a quarter of the film that I came back with was purchased in Japan. So um, that didn't get x-rayed at all. So I was able to su successfully get hand checks at every single airport and stop over and transfer except for one in Ho Chi Minh City. Not bad, right? So, you know, it would have been good to have a clean streak and have hand checks the whole way, considering we went through about like, uh, you know, 10 airport uh, securities, maybe roughly. But what I found a strategy that worked quite well after that experience in Saigon, because a lot of that was a back and forth and they were trying to call the supervisor and, and he was like, no, it's nothing, it's no big deal. And it was, they're all just speaking Vietnamese. So they didn't really understand it completely. What I uh, did from then on is used Google Translate to type up a message, you know, just a little sentence saying, um, this film is high sensitivity, contains ISO 3200, can you please hand check, whatever. And then when I did that in, Ho Chi, uh, in Hanoi, that seemed to work well, even though they were actually less um, resistant there, they were, it seemed like they would have hand checked it anyway. But then on the way back through Saigon again, uh, that worked. So it really also depends on who you get. That's a big part of it. So I don't really know if it was the message or not, but that helped. And same deal with Bangladesh. I've been there many times before, a few times, I shouldn't say many. Um, but, you know, a few times going through security because they x-ray twice there, you know, on the way into the airport, on the way onto the plane and, and all over the place. 
and uh, I've never been successful in asking for a handshake there. This time, I was successful um, on the way into the airport and on the way through the other security um, by using that translated message. So do that. It might help. It might help because sometimes it gets lost in translation. And that was a big lesson um, that I learned about uh, getting through x-ray security checks and whatever with your film. So yeah, one, one pass through x-rays, that'll be fine. Won't really affect anything. I've already processed two rolls of Kentmere 400. They look good. Yeah, everything's looking good. I'm, I'm trying to use a new developer now as well. So, But I'll talk more about that later. Let's get back on um, the chat. Garth, oh my God, made it to stream. Yeah, man, it's been a while. How have you been? How have you been? I feel like, you know, I, I see you every few months maybe. Um, Sunny 16 the whole time. Not the whole time. Uh, for the for the majority. So as usual, I fall back on Sunny 16 uh, for, for most of my street photography. But every now and then, as I've mentioned in some of my other videos, I'll pull out my handheld meter and check things, especially if the lighting's difficult or if I have the time just to kind of check my my baseline and, and sort of um, check my accuracy. It's good to do, even if you're relying on Sunny 16. That way you keep yourself sharp. Also, I've been toying around with the Astrohari little... A hot shoe light meter. I use this trip as an opportunity to mess with that a little bit more, see how I like it. And to be honest with you, I don't think I, I like using that. I mean, I don't mind it, but I still found it distracting to have a light meter on the camera. So it's just, just different to having a moment where you pause and you go, all right, let's read the light and pull out the handheld meter and angle it certain ways and, and do that. Um, sure, that's still some distraction, but yeah, I just found that using having the hot true mounted light meter and looking at it before taking the shot was distracting. So what I started to do is just leave it on there and then try and use it like I would the handheld is mostly ignore it. Then if I have a, a moment after taking a shot, check my Sunny 16 metering, but then I would fall into that trap of it being right there and then kind of looking at it too much. So I don't know. I don't know if I'll continue to use it, but yeah, that's, that's the Sunny 16 situation still loving that and relying on that christopher how much have i missed not much man you missed like a minute of me in the beginning trying to get the stream working and not even realizing that it probably was for about 40 seconds <laughs> um but yeah i'll leave this up for anyone who's going to watch later it's definitely nice if you can purchase film at your destination yeah so that was a situation uh, as i mentioned i took enough rolls to last me through vietnam and into japan and then in japan i bought um a whole bunch of black and white and some color even i bought two rolls of color plus um i bought a roll of their locally repackaged vision film it's called like multics or some weird name like that um, i'm sure you guys have seen it if you watched those videos recently that people are talking about japan manufacturing film again which i don't think is true i was there and i saw the situation i think it's probably still just old stuff that they're re um selling from frozen stock or whatever but we can talk about that another time or if anyone's interested let me know uh going to southern spain nice i've always wanted to go to spain that's on the list road trip in a camper van should be good man enjoy yeah yeah looking forward to seeing what you get yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what I get too. And yeah, here we go. Alex, hey bro. I am, <laughs> thanks man. I'm glad you can tell that I'm looking better. Dude, I was so sick. I didn't realize, it was like up and down. So if you didn't see my updates, I actually got sick twice during the trip and I hardly ever get sick. I hadn't been sick for, for about two years, right? Not even a cold. But that's what happens when you travel. You get exposed to new bugs and viruses and um your immune system's down you're not sleeping the same you're not exercising the same you're not you know on your normal schedule so i had a just a bit of a cold while in vietnam and that recovered within three days and then when i got to japan i started to feel sick again and i'm like what's going on and then i met up with you know mr alex munoz and then we uh, about at that time i was starting to feel worse and then i um did a COVID test the next day and it wasn't that but it felt really bad. It felt like a flu. I had like massive body aches and a cough started to develop and then um, just fatigue and yeah, all kinds of things. Chills, lots of chills. I couldn't sleep well. It was horrible. So about five days of, you know, feeling sick and then, you know, a few days on the shoulder of that 
not feeling 100%. So I didn't even shoot as much in Japan as I would have liked. Didn't go out and, and wake up in the morning and go shooting as I normally would have. So yeah, that was another thing that happened. But yeah, I'm, I got better. I was, I'm fine now. It, it was still cool to meet, man. It was really fun. And、um, I'm looking forward to your video, your video series, Canet Street.、Um, if you guys aren't subscribed to Alex on Streets, am, am I still calling your channel that when it's not actually called that?、Um, yeah, but, but go click on his name and check out his channel. Garth, dad of two? I thought you had one, man. That's amazing. Glad you're enjoying dad life. Not shooting much anymore, but. And not getting time to it. Yeah, it makes sense. I guess just, you know, shoot family stuff. That's what matters, right? Still shooting Retina. Nice. Go to any meetups in Japan. Yeah, so I just met up with Alex, but I wanted to meet up with more guys. Like, even Alex is talking about doing a second night where we could、um, catch up with Yusuke,、um, Nuts Tokyo. And then I had messages from other guys that I had long been following in Japan. And wanted to meet up with. I had people message me and say, hey, you're in Japan. Do you want to meet up?、Uh, but I just wasn't able to do it. Yeah. Because after having met up with Alex, I went and I did the COVID test the next day. Things got worse for, for a day or two. So I was only able to kind of go out on short walks, stay close to the Airbnb or within, you know, kind of short range and just take it easy. So unfortunately, Japan wasn't、um, what I had planned for it to be, but, you know, I'll be back. And I, I should ideally maybe organize something in advance in terms of a meetup. That would have been better. I even told some guys I might try and organize a group thing so I can meet up with a few people because it's really hard to do all that. But yeah, Garth, thanks for joining, man. Yeah, it's late over there. Have a good night.、Um, yeah, but it's okay. I mean, it happens. What can you do? I'm good now.、Uh, all right, let's look at Instagram. Let's see what people have asked over there. Um, I don't think I got too many questions, which is good because then I would have to have sifted through and then not answered everyone's questions. So I'd rather answer all of them and have less questions. Cool.、Uh, Jordan Godley, hey man. I don't know if you're watching, but your question was I have a holiday coming up and want a small pocketable film camera. Any recommendations? Sorry, I don't have this up on the screen for you guys. That's probably a way I could have done that, but you know, didn't get time.、Uh, and you had a follow up. Question saying preferably one with exposure comp or the ability to choose ISO. Now that limits you down a fair bit, but those are really good features to have. And when I was in the same boat wanting those features on a point and shoot, I landed on the Contax TVS. I bought that camera. I loved using it. I enjoyed it. I highly recommend it. I ended up selling it just because I wasn't using point and shoots as much anymore. And then I was trying to get money for a holiday at the time and whatever. But that would be one of my first recommendations. It's not as expensive as the T3 and all that.、It、still produces great images.、Uh, but you could go with any contacts, really. They're just so overpriced. That's the problem. So I'm sure there are other good point and shoot cameras that have ISO selection. I just can't think of any because I've mainly had experience with, with the contacts stuff and know of the contact stuff. So if anyone watching, Has one, leave it in the comments. Even if you're watching this post stream, I'm sure Jordan will probably check back or I can just message him and、um, he can check that out. Hello, Kamiru. Olympus Pen, yeah. I mean, was that considered a point shoot? I guess so. It's as small as one. But I was thinking you meant like just AF kind of point shoot.、Um, all right. JD. Hey, Hashem, what's your favorite film in 2024 and why? You know what? I'm liking Kent Mir 400. I spoke about it at the end of last year, or was it early this year? How it's like a great go to at the moment just to save a bit of money.、Um, not that HB5 is overpriced, HB5 is still well worth and affordable, but I just find that Kent Mir offers the same performance, more or less, especially when you're shooting at box speed or maybe 800. It might not push to 1600 as well, but even that it does. So, if you can save a few bucks per roll, I found that it's such a great、uh, black and white go to film and, and high performer. So, as it stands, that's probably my favorite. I just ordered another couple of rolls. So, I have something for back here in Australia because I went through all the film that I took traveling, by the way. Mr. Benjamin Neo, welcome back. Thanks. Excited for the visual updates when you get through film. Sorry to hear you got sick. Yeah, thanks, man. 
Um, I believe you had a question here next on Instagram. Favorite moments, most memorable experiences, and newest lessons taken from the trip. So favorite moments were probably the mountains of Viet. You would like this answer. The mountains of Viet um, North Vietnam. So doing the Ha Giang Loop and um, some areas surrounding Sa Pa, that was really cool. Uh, if anyone missed that, I can skip to it here. So, you know, visually, that was the, <laughs> the wanted bag that I had bought. That worked really well, by the way, for anyone who's wondering. Um, yeah, look at that. It was just amazing. And then stopping in towns, taking photos. Uh, we did this like sky trail thing and... It was really cool. Can everyone see the video? Hopefully. Um, yeah, so that that was really cool. Just being on the road, staying a night, continuing on the motorbike, stopping on the way, um, some great places along the way there, and then getting to meet people, other travelers, because it lended itself to a lot of, um, it was you know a little bit of a touristy thing to do, but it was really cool. Um, you can see the video, all right, cool, yeah. So. Let me keep playing it a little bit. Yeah, you'll recognize this, Ben. Yeah, this is the market in, in Sapa. It was like um, pretty colorful. Let me clear that. Um, yeah, beautiful colors. And I ended up shooting some on the, the point and shoot around here. Still stuck to mostly black and white because that's the kind of thing I'm, I'm aiming at at the moment. But yeah, you guys will see some upcoming um, street photography vlogs from that. But that was, that was probably one of my favorite memories from the trip um and newest lessons i don't know i guess the big the lesson i can think of is the one i just spoke about with the x-rays and trying to find strategies like you know the 3200 thing the dummy rolls and then translating that message when you're overseas because they might not just understand when i'm in bangladesh they think i'm saying that i have memory cards they look at the film rolls i don't even know what they are half the time because you have to think about it some of these guys working, they're like 19 or 20. They look at a film roll. They go, what the hell is this? They don't even, and that's what it seemed like. And then he's telling the other guys like, no camera memory. Okay. Put it in the x-ray. <laughs> um, but I'm sure there's more meaningful lessons that I probably learned that I just can't think of right now. Jay Matthews Olympus. Yeah. It's half frame, the Olympus. It's a cool camera though. I like the Canon Demi, but I wouldn't consider that a point and shoot in the traditional sense. Any other questions on Instagram? Um, get any of the new Japanese Fujifilm films. There are no Japanese new Fujifilm films. I think you probably mean the restocks, but I think people are conflating these restocks with the idea that Fujifilm is manufacturing film again. We can't know that. We can, you know, we can only assume and there's no reason to assume that they are so when i was there i actually even posted on instagram some of the the status of the film shops and the shelves and what they had it was pretty sparse i did start to notice that they are selling uh, more uh, fuji superior premium for example and packs of superior normal and fuji color 100 they've always had these stocks trickling through but just because they're on the shelves again uh, it, it wasn't that much and it was limited to one roll per stock as you guys might know and it still doesn't mean they're not just boxing up you know stuff they've already manufactured i would love to to hear um, that they are but without confirmation we can't know for sure um, did i buy any fuji film while i was there no i found that it was like um a bit pricey I bought two rolls of Color Plus. For some reason, that was even cheaper than Fujifilm, which is ridiculous. I used to go to Japan and get industrial and great stocks and three packs was premium. Now there's hardly any multi-packs and Superior Premium was really overpriced. If I had more money to spare, I probably would have bought some because I love Superior Premium, but no, nah, I didn't bother. I didn't bother buying any Fujifilm um, at, during that trip. I bought uh, Ilford and Kentmere and some Color Plus. And the, the Motics or whatever that film was. Um, what's it called? Some weird name. Uh, uh, let me answer this one. I, sorry for bouncing back and forth with the Instagram questions and the live ones, but I don't want the live chat to fall too far behind. So yeah, I had an aim to try and maintain some fitness while there. 
it's really hard to do while traveling because you just want to spend as much time going out and doing things and experiencing um, where you're traveling to. Uh, but I did try. So every trip I've been on recently, I've tried to maybe like visit a local gym or just try and keep active, which I do at least through going out for lots of walking and street photography. But then beyond that, doing some resistance training is part of my normal schedule. This trip I tried to take, I took my resistance bands because ever since, you know, lockdowns and all that, I bought these resistance bands that are, you know, decent enough to just maintain and, and get some movement and, and exercise your muscles a little bit. And then um, sometimes I'd even like found a local gym and bought a day pass uh, wherever I was traveling. I didn't do that. I wanted to do that this time around, but for various reasons, we were so busy in Vietnam, Japan, I was feeling sick and that, you know, uh, trickled over into to Bangladesh a little bit as well, feeling run down. So I mainly just had a few little home workouts, basically doing push-ups and using the resistance bands. And uh, it was better than nothing. I think doing something is better than nothing. And I don't know if I maintained as well as I could have, but yeah, it was okay. Olympus isn't a point shoot, but super small aperture priority. Yeah, great cameras. I'd recommend any small Olympus, to be honest. I used to love the Olympus AF Super, AF1, AF10. They're really good, but they don't have, um, those ones I just mentioned don't have exposure compensation. They might have like a plus half or plus one backlight compensation, but it's not the same. All right, let's go back and check the last Instagram question. It's from Alex. Alex Munoz. Uh, do you have a favorite photo moment in your head? Yeah, you know what? I don't have any single moment. It's really good when you do. When you have that experience where, let's say you've gone out and shot street for a whole day or you've gone on a trip and shot for a whole week and this one moment sticks in your head and you know it's going to be a good shot and you can't wait to see it or whatever. I didn't have any of those, unfortunately. But sometimes you have... Uh, a non-memorable moment, but then you come back and look in the shot and you go, whoa, I wasn't expecting that. So maybe I'll have that instead. Um, so yeah, that was the last question from Instagram. And because I was gone for six weeks, you know, all, uh, those moments get buried. I might've had something that was kind of like, I think that's going to be a good shot, but it just gets buried down. And when you're shooting film, you kind of like, you, you don't have that instant feedback. So it just gets buried. Unless it's a really, really good moment, which I, I didn't have anything that I can remember. Okay. It's good to be back, by the way. Sorry for all the weird hiccups with these live streams. It's just the nature of it, I guess. Some more point and shoot recommendations. Time for some body recomp. I do need to get back into it. I did one quick full body workout, like just a 20 minute one, because even that, if you haven't worked out for a month and a half, you do like a 15 minute workout with proper weights and you'll feel sore. And I felt sore just from doing that, you know, just a couple of sets of light bench, deadlift squats, some, you know, presses and curls and whatever, calf raise and bam, <laughs> whole body's like somewhat sore. So I'm going to try and um, ease back into it. Body re recomp, probably I won't do that. I might do a bulk over winter. That's usually what I like doing. I'd like to see some review for the Wandered Bag. Yeah, yeah. I, I will eventually talk more about it because it was really good. It worked perfectly, especially for doing the motorbike stuff for Vietnam for the way we had our trip set up. Uh, I still had moments when I would just go out with just the camera with my honor bag, uh, you know, little street photography walks, for example. Oh, you spoke to her about coming to Australia? Tell him to meet us in New Zealand. That could work. Yeah, I love New Zealand. Let me, if you're planning on going there, let me know when. Um, hello from Ireland. Is there anything you wish you took or left film camera wise? Ooh, good question. Noth so there's one admission I have to make. Uh, with the video uh, where I said what I'm packing, I laid out everything I was going to take and I said there might be some last minute changes. One of them was in regards to whether I take the film point and shoot or just stick with the XZ1. I just stuck with the XZ1. And another thing that, one thing that did change is I ended up caving and taking the Thypoc 35 1.4. Even though I already took my 35 Zeiss 2.8, I was planning on doing some night videos and I thought, ah, uh, you know what, let's just, I weighed up my bag and I was like, if I take some lenses, put them in my pockets, I can stay under the seven kilos. And I was like, let's just take it anyway. 
Now, I don't regret taking that lens because I did end up using it a fair bit for the night stuff, especially in Japan, but I didn't use it as much as the other lenses, except I knew I wouldn't. So if there was one lens I could have left behind, probably would have been that one. Um, anything I wish I took? Not really. I think I forgot some stepping rings and stuff like that, uh, but no. Um, damn, you're fast already having a video almost ready. Sweet. Ah, uh, what I showed you in that little trailer thing, that's not for publication as is. That was just for the purpose of the stream. But I am working on um, my first video back, which will be kind of in chronological order of the trip so far, uh, which is going to be the Ho Chi Minh street photography um, street process video, the point of view street, uh, you know, video. So I've actually started editing that. I've started edit uh, I processed the two roles from that session, and then I'll be able to release that video in the coming days, hopefully. Uh, ben, you recognize it all? Yeah, man, I'm sure you do. It wasn't what I expected, actually. It was uh, Sapa was a lot more touristy than I even thought it was. In general, I know you can get out of the main town, but um, yeah, it was just a different vibe than I had thought. Village is the best for most unique experiences. Can't wait to see it all. Yeah, man, let's catch up. You're still in Melbourne, yeah? Second Bob, hey man, good to see you again. Uh, I'm gonna process all my own color myself. No, I'll do all my black and white, but the color, because the color I shot, a lot, four rolls were from Mr. Negative. So he does ECN2 here in Melbourne, small independent lab that focuses on repackaged cinema films, both with and without Remjet. I'm uh, trying out their films for the first time i met gareth the owner he actually recommended one of the spots that i ended up shooting in ho chi minh city because he's been to vietnam i think he said he lived there and i'll be taking some of those films back to him to check out his process of doing both the uh you know kodak vision films i have some fuji eterna which is really exciting if you guys remember i spoke about that um and then the other film i have i i just i probably won't do it myself it's just i'm not going to buy chemicals for a few rolls and two rolls of slide film I shot, so I need to get them done EC, uh, in E6. Black and white, I'll do myself. What developer am I using now? I've always used HD 110 for the most part, but for some of this stuff, because some of it might go into my upcoming book, I'm gonna try and use a different developer with a little bit more sharpness, a bit, little bit less grain, a little bit more shadow detail than HD 110 offers. HD 110 is a great all-rounder, but I ordered some uh, D76 or Ilford ID11, they're both the same thing from Decisive Moment for all my 400 speed stuff. And then I pushed some rolls to 1600 and for optimal results in that, I ordered some um, Ilford Microfen, Microfen? I think that's what it's called. Yeah, I've used it before. It's really great for pushing HP5. So I'll do the five rolls that I pushed in that and that will give me hopefully the best results for the for the important stuff and then i actually bought a pack of super pro doll in japan fujifilm developers super cheap there i was actually with alex we walked into yodabashi or big camera and he he showed me how cheap they're like 200 300 yen for a, a little pouch a one liter pouch of um microfine which is the, like the lower speed developer and super pro doll which is the higher speed stuff when i had gone back on my last day in Japan, I was like, let me go buy some film and some that cheap developer. Hardly anyone had stock and the Yodobashi I went to only had like one sachet of Super Pro Doll. I would have bought more, I wish I did, but I bought one. And I actually uh, used that yesterday to develop two rolls of Kentmere. Turned out great. It's a little bit uh, overdeveloped, I think. So, and it's hard to find the times for it, but that's a great developer. It gives a little bit more sharpness and shadow detail, a bit finer grain than HD 110 uh, again. Um, so it's kind of similar, I guess, to HD 110 or D76. It's just a little bit higher speed, but I like the results from it. So I'm not too consistent with developers. I kind of just use what I feel like at the time and what suits the, the film. Getting into TLRs, have you been using them recently? If not, why not? Thank you for the videos. Great to hear. Have I been using them? Not too recently uh, because I was traveling and I didn't take any medium format cameras. Uh, before that I was though. If you've seen the channel, you know I did a video on the Rolleiflex. I even shot my Yashica Flex to kind of compare it to. 
I still have my Ashka Flex. I still enjoy shooting it from time to time. It's kind of like when you came to Europe. Yeah, yeah, when I did the Middle East Europe trip, um, I kind of uploaded them chronologically. Yeah, it'll be similar to that, but I might have some other videos in between because I've, I've got so much content this time, even more than that, I think. But I've tried to make some of the easier to produce videos where it's just the point of view camera walking the streets because they're just much easier to film and to edit than um, some of the other types of more cinematically produced videos. And even then when I did those from like Turkey and, and Greece and they didn't really get many views and they took a long time. I still enjoyed making them, um, but I enjoy making the street POVs just as much, if not more, because that's really the, the core of what I enjoy doing is going out and shooting. So I don't know, I'll mix it up. I'll probably have a combination of video styles coming up over the next two months. Greetings from Seattle. Thanks, man. Welcome back. Been waiting to hear about your trip. Yeah. Hopefully, um, if you missed the first half, you can go back and rewatch it. Christopher, great. I use ID11 myself. Makes nice flat 400 ISO. Yep, HP5 and nice push 60. Okay, yeah, I know it definitely can push as well. I just thought while I'm ordering some stuff, I'll get some microphone. It's cheap and I can just um, do it. I have a five roll tank, so I can just put five rolls, do all the 1600 at once. Plus, if you buy the five liter powder, it lasts forever. Yeah, yeah. I think I bought individual one liter pouches just so I can kind of section it out. Any regrets not bringing the Pentax? No, not really. I mean, there were times when I wished I had a medium format, but I wasn't really in those situations much at all. The, the way I was shooting was with my uh, documentary style black and white stuff in mind. So I wasn't really aiming for the kind of stuff that I would shoot on medium format as much. And when I did have those shots in mind, at least I had the opportunity to take my Canon R6 and, and shoot that. It's not the same. There were shots that would have been cool on the Pentax, but wouldn't have been worth bringing all the way along for the whole trip. Uh, considering everything else that I bought. I'm getting into making developers from scratch with Darkroom Cookbook. Very cool. Yeah, I've always um, heard about that. There's a lot of developers I want to try as well. A lot of really cool stuff that I wouldn't mind trying. I actually have some interesting developers that were given to me by um, a friend that I've yet to use. I think they're designed for like the F key low speed films. And they come in like a little vial. I can't remember the name of them. They're really interesting and rare. All right, guys, go through the live chat. So I think we can sum up here. I'll just make sure I didn't miss any um, Instagram Q and A's. Yeah, I got through all that. So yeah, hopefully that covers everything uh, in terms of, I don't know, the, the basic summary of the travels. If you have any other questions, let me know. Sorry about the squeaky chair. I know that must be really annoying. My chair is starting to squeak. Maybe it needs WD-40 or replacement <laughs> every time I move. Uh, yeah, if there's anything you want to ask before I end the stream, let me know. Uh, if you watch this later, congratulations on making it all the way through. And uh, leave any questions or comments in the, the comment box and I'll try and get to it. Got to say respect cranking out the videos. I'm not a fan of editing yeah, I'm not really either much. I mean, it's kind of fun sometimes, kind of not. Um, it's not my thing, but it must be done. Yeah, that's exactly it. And I still would rather edit myself. Uh, I'm getting to the point where I think it would be good to have help editing. When would you lose, use a little point and shoot? See, when, for example, when I was traveling, the way the point and shoot came in handy was because I, I mainly had black and white loaded in the, the Leica, I would enjoy having the point and shoot in my bag or pocket for color shots so i would take that out if i saw a really cool color scene or something that lended itself better to color so that's a cool situation to have it or if we were going out and i just didn't want to take film i didn't want, it was going to be dark or whatever reason just having a flash maybe meant that i would just go out with a point and shoot and just have at least one camera so that's another situation where i would usually use a point and shoot if i don't want to take anything else i want to keep it compact light just walk and have something in the pocket 
you've got an XQ1, nice, nice. Pretty cool, 12 megapixels. Yeah, 12 megapixels is actually heaps. Yeah, anyway, um, thanks for joining guys. I will, like I mentioned, have a video up for you soon on um, shooting the streets of Ho Chi Minh City. So that'll be, uh, you know, this video here. Excuse the weird faces and freeze frames. Yeah, it was cool. I only have like one little segment in there. That's actually... Yeah, so like, um, you know, some of these little alleys and streets of, of just Vietnam. So I'm going to start with Vietnam since that's the country we started in. And then um, I have some other videos coming up in between that uh, series of street videos, which will be things like doing night exposures in Japan. That's going to be exciting. That's more of like a, a long form type video. And then some other stuff. I'll try and keep up on the streams as well and the regular updates. Maybe I'll do a book sharing live stream soon. I've got uh, some photo books that I want to talk about and look at and share. Uh, but let me know if there's anything you want to see. I'm always open to feedback and, and suggestions and um, so much that I want to do though. It's just hard. There's people I want to interview. I've actually even like started to queue some of them up and uh, yeah, it's tricky. But yeah, thanks Chris for joining man and all your uh, you know chats and, and contribution on the, on the stream here. It really helps make it <laughs> worthwhile having your interactions. But yeah, overall seems like you enjoyed yourself. Definitely important thing. Cheers. God bless. Looking forward to seeing the work. Thank you, man. Yeah. looking. For, I hope you enjoy your trip to Spain. All right, everyone. Thanks for joining. I'm going to end it there and uh, I'll see you on the next video.